Ah. So Thor Love and Thunder just came out, or as I will forever call it, Thor 4 More Thors, and it's... Eh. It's not the worst thing in the entire world, but I was pretty disappointed. As the new number one fan of Gore the God Butcher, I feel like they didn't do that character much justice, and there were some decisions toward the end that I really don't care for. If you want to see my full thoughts, check out my podcast Fanboy Talk, where we went super in-depth with spoilers. After watching it, my biggest takeaway had less to do with the movie itself, and more so a bigger issue with a lot of current Marvel products. Something I've wanted to talk about for a while. Marvel has a CGI problem. Also, we got a real set today because uh, if I use the green screen, that'd be a little ironic. Now, before you go off in the comments, a quick little preface here. I know there's been a whole bunch of discourse about this and you might be sick of it, which I totally get. This video is not the CGI is bad take that you might think it is. I'm not saying that Marvel should have a practical Hulk or they should have cast a real life dragon for Shang-Chi. Although now that you mention it, I have a tremendous amount of respect for visual effects and CGI artists. I think it requires an insane amount of talent and skill to create stuff like that. And it is 100% a valid art form that deserves as much praise as anything else in the industry. Also, when I say CGI, I'm really talking about visual effects in general. Technically, CGI is more of a specific term with computer-generated models and environments, and visual effects encompasses all sorts of things, including CGI, chroma keying, rotoscoping, which I'll talk about later, in-camera effects, and a whole bunch of other stuff. But CGI is the term that most people are familiar with, and it makes for a catchier title. So many movies use CG and visual effects in ways that you may not even notice to enhance their visuals and the story being told. So a movie using it is by no means a bad thing. However, the overuse of these effects starts to become an issue when they become too much of a distraction and break our suspension of disbelief. So I would say that Marvel's CGI struggles in two separate areas. The first being what I would call unfinished effects. I don't like to call these effects bad because as we'll talk about later, the artists work incredibly hard and oftentimes are not the ones responsible when something doesn't look as good as it probably should. A notable example being in the trailer for She-Hulk where the main character looks noticeably less detailed than Bruce Banner's Hulk does. I know it's just a trailer, but the show's coming out in like a month. It's probably gonna look like that. If you compare how someone like Iron Man looked in 2008 versus how he looks 10 years later, you can start to see what I'm talking about. And the second area is what I would call unnecessary effects. These are things that with a reasonable amount of pre-production and planning would be expected to be done practically. An example being in this scene in No Way Home, the Green Goblin mask is fully CG despite a practical helmet having existed since 2002. What happened to it? Where did it go? Did we lose it? And in Thor Love and Thunder, it's these weird CGI helmets that are always tracked to Hemsworth and Portman's faces. Things that by all means could and realistically should be real and tangible and instead for various reasons are done in CG. Now there's almost always an explanation for why something like this is done. In Endgame, the time travel suits were entirely CGI because the designs of the costumes weren't finalized by the time they began shooting. The same for Spider-Man in Civil War and Nick Fury's gun in Far From Home. For the Green Goblin mask, it's most likely because a practical helmet would have issues with reflections. This shot was going around on Twitter for a while with Flash Thompson standing on a street from GTA 3, and this is because Tony Revolori had scheduling conflicts and wasn't able to film that shot on a real street. Marvel also really likes to use CGI to cover up imperfections in the costumes, oftentimes completely replacing the costume for some reason. Basically, in every one of these cases, there's a clear reason for why it was done in CG versus practical. And if you ask me, the occasional instance of this is not the end of the world. Some things fall through the cracks and have to be fixed in post. Like this scene in No Way Home, regular blind lawyer Matt Murdock was initially catching a snow globe that was thrown through the window, and it was decided that it didn't look right in camera, and so it was replaced with a brick. In my opinion, that's totally understandable, and not everything's going to be perfect, and sometimes it's better to use effects to fix it instead of doing a whole reshoot. However, when you line them all up in a row like this, the pattern's becoming pretty recognizable. Now, I've seen a lot of people saying that the reason this is done is because of pandemic restrictions, with Marvel wanting to maintain a safe filming environment. And I do believe that's part of it. The pandemic's not over by any means, and I'm 100% a believer in safety precautions for film sets. However, some of this has been going on since 2018, and I think there's a bigger, clearer reason for why it's done. The Marvel Pipeline. The Marvel Cinematic Universe is a machine. There is so much content created by this company. In the past year, we've had Black Widow, Shang-Chi, Spider-Man No Way Home, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, Thor Love and Thunder, Loki, Hawkeye, What If, Moon Knight, Ms. Marvel, and soon to be She-Hulk. <sighs> Crazy hot take here. That's a lot of things. Now, Marvel is a massive company and there's obviously teams upon teams of people working on all these projects. However, there are so many things being made, usually with such a short turnaround time, that a lot of times the creators behind these properties struggle to keep up and are unable to properly plan the production. And planning is one of, if not the most important thing when making a movie or TV show. Pre-production is where the director has to manage scheduling, storyboards, script changes, previs, costumes, props, concept art, set design, literally you name it and it is most likely handled during pre-production. A good plan can make or break a movie. That is quite literally the job of the director, to give the production direction. And so with all these things to do while releasing so many products so frequently, some people get stretched thin and more things fall through the cracks. Costumes aren't designed before filming dates, actor schedules aren't set in stone, they don't have time to go through the Sony lot to look for the old Green Goblin mask. I mean, seriously, where is it? 
And I think if Marvel were to slow their productions down to let's say two movies and two shows per year, not only would that do a lot to prevent this overuse of VFX, but it would also help combat the ever-growing fatigue people are having with the superhero genre. When you emphasize quantity, no matter what, the quality will always suffer. Believe me, I know I'm a YouTuber. Now you might be saying, I don't notice when they use effects like this, and if they ever do, it doesn't bother me. And I totally respect that. If the visuals aren't that important to you, that's a subjective taste. But there is a little bit of a bigger issue than just how the movie looks, and that's... That's right, it's one of those videos. Corporations by nature want to constantly maximize profits, right? Meaning that they'll often look for the cheapest and fastest ways to make their product. And that happens all the time with the VFX industry because visual effects workers are non-union. Let me say that again. Visual effects workers are not unionized. This means it's legal to work artists harder and for longer hours without substantially paying them fairly. In the long run, it's cheaper and faster to fully CGI something as opposed to hiring a practical prop or costume designer to make it for real because those workers are unionized. This is oftentimes the reason why the CGI may not look as good. For example, it's been said that She-Hulk's model was initially much more muscular, and the CGI artists were told to keep slimming her down over the course of the show's production, meaning that the effects are less polished than someone like Bruce Banner Hulk would be. This is not a decision made by the director or anyone specific person. I'm not saying that Dr. Kevin Feige is in the render farms forcing people to miss Christmas with their families, but it's a flawed system that the company uses to make content faster and cheaper. A lot of what these artists will be doing, especially with this fix it in post mindset, is what's called rotoscoping. That's basically cutting out a subject by hand, frame by frame from the background. At 24 frames a second, to rotoscope just a minute of footage, you need to hand cut out the subject almost 1500 times. It's one of the most tedious and annoying jobs you could do in effects, I know because I've had to do it and it sucks. And don't just take my word for it. A Reddit post from the subreddit r slash VFX, which is a community for veteran visual effects workers, says, I am quite frankly sick and tired of working on Marvel shows. Marvel has probably the worst methodology of production and VFX management out there. They can never fix the look for their show before more than half the allocated time for the show is over. The artists working on Marvel shows are definitely not paid equivalent to the amount of work they put in. The charm for working on a Marvel movie is way overrated now, and I'd rather be happy working on a TV series after decades and decades of this. And if you look at the comments of this post, you can see a majority of people agreeing and sharing similar experiences with the company. And so that's why the I didn't notice it so it doesn't bother me argument won't work forever. Because the process inherently encourages crunch, and so any decision to fix it in post leads to countless more hours of unhealthy working conditions in the visual effects department. A lot of people collectively understand that crunch is bad in the video games industry, so why should it be any different for the film industry? The VFX industry as a whole has some fundamental flaws, and its artists need to fight to become unionized and paid fairly. It's not entirely Marvel's fault, but Marvel is profiting off the system more than any other company with the way that it approaches VFX. This all feels like such a downer, and I'm sorry about that, but there is some hope that this might not be the case forever. Firstly, with more big-name directors like Sam Raimi fighting to keep their directorial vision, last-minute changes could, in theory, become less common and lead to less of a need for these kinds of visual effects. It's part of why Doctor Strange as an Evil Dead-style zombie in full practical makeup was the coolest thing in the entire world. Add on top of that is the introduction of Stagecraft, or as you might know it, The Volume. It was created by ILM and Greg Frazier for The Mandalorian, and has since been used for things like The Book of Boba Fett and The Batman, and in theory it should be capable of solving all these issues. To sum it up, it's a large wall of LEDs that project an image of a 3D background that's rendered in real time with the camera movement, simulating depth. When implemented properly, it allows for more pandemic-safe filming on a soundstage, it captures the digital background and camera so there's less rotoscoping, last-minute changes to the environment can be done on set so it can help save time for pre-production, actors can see the environment and give a better performance, and it generates environmental lighting so it's easier to shoot reflective objects like that green goblin mask, where is it? But that's the thing, when it's implemented properly. And that's where we come back to Thor Love and Thunder. Because Thor Love and Thunder used stagecraft during its production, and Thor Love and Thunder looked like a big pile of it wasn't all bad, as always the big vistas and silhouette shots were good for Twitter screen grabs, but for so many scenes the characters clearly looked like they were standing in front of a screen, and a lot of times it was really distracting. In this shot even, you can see the line where the real grass ends and the digital grass begins. It very well might be that the reason it worked so well in The Mandalorian and The Batman is because both of those were DP'd by Greg Frazier, who helped create the technology. The dude is legendary, so it wouldn't surprise me, but I also believe that since the technology is in its infancy, people are going to have to learn how to use it properly. The volume generates light, but not enough to entirely light the subject. It's not not just an easy mode button, there's nuance to lighting and the way to shoot subjects while using the volume to make it a seamless transition. It's going to be a learning experience for everybody involved, but if you're able to learn those nuances, it can be super powerful. 
And that's why this video is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for anyone who loves learning and wants to explore their creativity and learn new skills. If you have a specific skill you're trying to learn, Skillshare is where you want to start. From photography to filmmaking to graphic design, writing, and more, you can find classes that will always match your goals. I talk a lot about this new technology, Stagecraft, which is essentially projecting a virtual background in camera. It's this revolutionary tool that when done right can possibly change the film industry forever. And the best part about it is that it's all done in Unreal Engine 5, which is a free software that anyone can download. And if you want to get into the industry, getting an understanding of how that's done is super important. And so I've been using the class Unreal Engine 5 for beginners, Learn the Basics of Virtual Production by Jordi Vandeput, who you might know from his YouTube channel, Cinecom.net. The course is super in-depth, teaching you all the ins and outs of virtual production within Unreal Engine, and it's really helped me get a better grasp of how that technology works and even ways that I can apply it to my own projects. The first 1,000 people to use my link in the description will get their first month free of Skillshare. Remember that right now, the skills to be creative are right at your fingertips, and thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. I promise this whole video wasn't just for the sponsor. I've been wanting to talk about this for a while. Now, I'm not trying to ruin these movies or anything. It should go without saying, but if you enjoy the MCU, you're not like a bad person or a corporate bootlicker or anything like that. I just think it's important to look with a critical eye at the practices of these studios, especially one as massive and influential as Disney. You may not care too much about the visuals, but at its core, film is a visual medium. Why should we settle for the bare minimum from the biggest movie franchise in the world, often at the expense of the workers involved, when in this year alone, with movies like The Batman, Top Gun, everything everywhere all at once, it's been proven that we can have so much more. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. If you liked this video, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. Like I said, we got an episode of my podcast, Fanboy Talk, on Thor Love and Thunder, so check that out if you're interested. Spider-Man 6 is coming soon. It's a big video. Guys, it's a really big video. Remember that thing I said about quantity and quality? Special thanks to Alta the Sting, Cassidy Bond, Chicken McDoofus, Tamp Towels, Iron Ninja, Jonah, Corey's Not Fresh, Lime Spice XL, Logan Triplet Films, Ryder Harrison, The Artsy Fartsy Guy, Tim Newfeld, Tyler Goodrich, Yobi Perkins, Zachary Stonebreaker, Zero to Hero 148, and ZZ Toasty for being spectacular fanboys on my Patreon. This has been Troy Boy 17 coming at you live. Fuck the Supreme Court. Be responsible, and I'll see you guys around.